Hey, hi, where the hell have you been? Busy, jeez, be nice, it's not like I'm being paid for this, god. Arguably three films too late, A View to a Kill is in my eyes the end of the classic Bond era. Roger Moore was my James Bond, the one I watched as a kid and the one I enjoyed the most as a grown up. And looking back on his seven films, they have a tackiness I appreciate more than Connery's women beating smugness. A View to a Kill is not a great send off, but it's undeniably still feels like a Bond film, even if Roger Moore's looking winded and the action is at a man with the golden gun load. Into the mat opening! Bond finds another dead double O in Russian snow land and plucks a microchip off his corpse. The opening suffers first and foremost from being stuff we've really seen before, like twice now. And better. And right out the gate, Moore is just super silly old. And I'll at least credit a view to kill with putting the insufferable part right at the beginning. As much as I love Roger Moore, his films often have that moment that just fucking kills me. The slide whistle on the man with the golden gun, the double taking pigeon in Moonraker, the Tarzan yelling octopus, he just brief, horrid moments. A view to the kill's horrid moment is the use of the Beach Boys in the opening as Bond snowboards on a busted ski of a snowmobile. Of all the above-mentioned moments, I guess this is the least offensive. An iceberg submarine is different, I guess. So is Grandpa making out with a 20-year-old. At least the theme song kicks ass. Like it's the only good one of the 80s. And I don't even give two shits about Duran Duran. And I have terrible music tastes. But it's a kick-ass theme, easily in the top five. Well played, Duran Duran. Only time I'm ever going to say that, ever. And it's, you know, it's super ninja clear that the 80s are happening hard. Damn, Roger, just old, dude. Well, at least, damn, Money Penny, just old and M. Oh, yeah, that's sad. Well, Q, uh, well, he's always been old, so that's okay. So standard Bond plot intro, hell, just like Man with the Golden Gun. We get to see Q and his new toy, the snooper, a highly sophisticated piece of surveillance equipment. And honest to goodness, how the hell would something that looks like a sentient peanut butter grinder ever be covert? So, into the plot, with Q talking about silicon integrated circuits. And in the future world of 2013, this 1985 jargon is War Games Tron style adorable. They prattle on about how magnetic pulses from nuclear explosions could fry them and how modern toasters in British defense would be paralyzed. Then Q uses the hilarious micro comparator and reveals that the KGB are getting chips that are impervious to nuclear damage like the British. So a conspiracy is afoot and the plot is on. The company the British used was acquired by Zorin Industries and Commander Bond is on the case, but not before some good old-fashioned British fucking around. This is all good, though, because it's Money Penny's send-off, as Lois Maxwell has passed her prime, even if sexistly, Roger Moore has not. It's cute. And they work in some decent exposition stuff about Zorin. Damn, Christopher Walken. Actually, you look youthful and Oscar-worthy. Also, we see Mayday, played by Grace Jones. Then Patrick Bruni, fucking, what's his name, from the Avengers? That's cool, right? Shows, he, he's, he's, uh, oh, he's there, and oh, he's right in the world. He's Sir Godfrey Tibbet. Horse trainer and agent, I guess. Whatever. Bond sets off for Paris to meet a detective on Zorn's case about doping horses, or... They don't actually... Actually, he's just trying to figure out why horses win. So, anyway, Paris. Let me just check that off of the places for Bond to go list. We'll learn more about Zorin. He's from East Germany, and this guy is French and insufferable, because why the hell not? British people are making this movie. They don't like the French. And, of course, saw that coming. He's killed by butterflies. Wait. What? Fine. A chase ensues, and up the Eiffel Tower we go. Elaborate stunts are the name of this game. This one is admittedly cool, even if you can see the little diving board she leapt off of. This leads into an improbable but nifty car chase through the streets of Paris. Good stunts, and though half a car is kind of goofy, it still was staged and well, and it is pretty engaging. Off to Zorn's estate for standard Bond party with the villain antics, but this time with Patrick McNee in tow. I, I just like Bond's alias of Sinjin Smythe. I use it sometimes. You know, on, on porn forums for weird things with animal. No. So, uh, horses, not not much of a fan. This party is all very, eh, it's just sort of long and slow. It's, it's all stuff we've seen before, and there's just, there just ain't much to differentiate it. Some good stuff with Tibbet, though, and Moore and McNeat play well off of each other. There's this fun little bit. Tibbet pretends to be his driver, and while he's carrying all his luggage, Bond offers to help him and only grabs the umbrella because... It's Patrick McNee from The Avengers. I wish I could recall his character's name, and I'm not recording this where I have the internet, so sh shut up. Uh, Emma Peel? Ah, uh, whatever. Seriously, buddy cop movie with these two, you know, just, just palling around, and I'm so crazy down with that. We get a bit more time with Zorin and his stuffy party, meet Dr. Evil McMonagle, who's totally not Nazi, and finally meet Stacy Sutton, played by Tanya Roberts. So they don't say her name yet. She often gets flack for being one of the worst Bond girls, and sure, within one line, you're sure she ain't fucking Olivier, but seriously, she's no worse than any other Bond girl up to this point. Then Grandad starts forgetting where he is and starts hitting on his niece. 
The whole scene is weird because Moore's voice is soft and hushed. Stacy blows him off, which I think is supposed to convey that she's a strong-willed, independent woman in the 80s, but it just comes off like she's barely humoring a very nice but kind of creepy older fella. I love you, Raj. So some horse conspiracy stuff with microchips and Mayday forgetting and then remembering who Bond is in like this ridiculously convenient way. Bond being in her bed is pretty damn clever. There's this really bizarre cut when Mayday gets in the bed, like right when she gets in, like they cut to a different take. I don't really get that. It's right there before the good times, fun, sexy times, you know, times. Go, Raj, go. Zorin figures out who Bond is using his future computer, technology. Zorin plans to kill Bond with horsey time. Nobody cares. Nice hat. What kind of asshole smokes in a closed phone booth? Jesus. So Mayday kills Tibbetts, which, like when VJ dies in an uh, octopusy, is really just sad. But she does do it in the car wash, which is, you know, in this nicely framed shot as, as the thing kind of goes over the car. Which also means that she was doing her job as Zorin's killer assistant at the car wash, which means that technically she was working at the car wash. Which, you might never get rich, but it's better than digging a ditch. Working at the car wash, yeah. So horsey kill time, you know, continues, and it's, that's different. It's not really exciting. There's there's sort of funny horsey traps and horsey fighting and all kinds of excuses to say horsey, but it's also bizarre and illogical. It's like a course set up solely to kill a man on a prized horse. This is one of those just shoot him moments. Well, they, or Mayday could have fucked him to death the previous night. He's old. Uh, lots of obvious stunt doubles for old man more and lots of shots of walking on an obviously fake horse that moves noticeably slower than the real one does. It's different, like I said, but it's weird at best. Zoran uses his microchip powers to make Bond's horse freak out into the woods, and I actually like that part because it was like horse racing horses in the woods, and Mayday tricks him when she's driving the car, and there's some decent dialogue with Zoran and Bond genuinely looking outsmarted, which I enjoy. They go to dump him in the lake, and he survives cleverly, so that's so cool. Then, oh fuck yeah, Dolph Lundgren. I mean, General Golgo whom I love, so just happy to see him. So Zorin is working for the Russians. Oh, snap! But he's going renegade! Oh, snap! And Dolph Lundgren, oh, snap! Also, he's some sort of biological freak, so, you know, that's cool. They, they kind of mention that. They do a good job doling out information in the movie about what's going on. We get a good old-fashioned bad guy explains the plot to other bad guys seen right out of Goldfinger, but on a blimp, because Hindenburg? Uh, blimp is different, so that's cool. Zorn explains his plot to corner the microchip market, and all he has to do is crush Silicon Valley to do it, which he dramatically shows with this rad model. Except that it's like a commissioned model of Silicon Valley, not, not Fort Knox or Pyramids of Giza or the Great Wall of China. I mean, look at it. It's just some lame-ass buildings with dirt around it. It's like a model of an outlet store. He could have just wrote Silicon Valley on the table. So after one guy opts out and falls to his death, we get to San Francisco, the exotic locale that I totally don't appreciate because I live in Sacramento and I'm like two hours from it. But it's cool, just like with Star Trek IV. So Bond is in San Francisco talking to Chuck Lee, CIA, and he gets his business on, explains some plot plots, explains that Dr. Mortimer is actually Hans Glau, German pioneer of steroids and freaking Nazi experimenter, and who made super babies that went mad. Oh no, Max Zorin. Oh, that's so awesome though. His Nazi bred super villain Christopher Walken is really cool. So Bond Bond investigates Zoran's oil refinery, and, and so is, you know, like, some Russians. Bond sneaks in the valve pipe to this dead end with a propeller of death, and I'm not sure why he did this other than some action. The Russians watching Zoran try to escape, but only the chick does, and this other dude planted a bomb that he could totally use to just kill Zoran right now, but he defuses it so the movie can continue. Zoran kills him terribly, of course. Bond confronts in quotes, the Russian chick. It's good Bond stuff. Then the Russian chick bolts with a cassette she's recorded to a car, which very clearly has that man in it, but he must be wearing a disguise, because bam, it's just General Gogo. Jesus, everybody gets an old man stunt double in this movie. I'll ignore the fact that the head of the KGB, continued nemesis friend of Bond, an all-around re representative frickin' Russia in the Bond universe is doing grunt work driving a car. Bond gets a bit more info on Zorn from the Russian lady's tape and then goes to see why Zorn might be pumping seawater into his own pipeline. Bond also refers to himself by the alias James Stock. Heh, <laughs> Stocks and Bonds. Dork. Stacy Sutton shows up and Bond tails her back to her goofy big-ass house. Nice car, Bond. Thanks, 80s. Bond goes up to the house. He pops the window with the power of product placement. Stacy just is in this big empty house 
which seemed to be in the movie because someone let them film there, and Bond takes a sweet time walking around for no real reason at all. He scares the cat, looks at some paintings, and continues to contribute to the movie being on the slow side. He then goes in Stacy's room, and hell, he could have just knocked on the door, really. I mean, this is just more stuff to add to his creep factor with Stacy. Bad guys attack, and Bond kicks some ass with a shotgun full of rock salt, which I actually thought was funny, but... It's another small, kind of lame little fight. Just another bizarre action scene where it barely makes sense. They even seem to make a big deal out of this urn with Stacy's like granddad in it, but it's clearly empty in the scene. Bond makes Stacy fancy ass quiche, and we get some info from Stacy about her story. She's the only heir to an oil company granddad owns. Zorin bought out illegally, and she works as a geologist to hold on to the, her home because she sold all her furniture, fighting Zorin in court, and. Eh, yeah, it's a good enough reason for the empty house, but it's still weird. Bond wakes to find Stacy up on her fancy computer. Two colors. They figure out that there's some sort of something up with Zorin, because he's flooding the faults with seawater, and a, and a minor tremor happens near his oil field. Chuck Lee is killed, and Bond and Stacy head off to City Hall to look at public records. The suspense is killing me. Then they go do that. Like, look at public records. Like, that's the fun part. They do discover that Main Strike is an abandoned silver mine near the San Andreas Fault. Zorn shows up and sets up a rather good death for Bond. Christopher Walken does a really fine job of playing a rather subdued psychopath. Zorn sets fire to City Hall, and this stuff ain't bad, especially when it segues into a fire engine ch chase through the streets of San Francisco. Bond gets stuck out on the ladder, and a lot of time and effort is put into pointing out that the ladder isn't locked, just setting it up so he can get stuck on it, and then they're just there's just some awful humor with cop. And then they totally set up that they're going to jump a fire truck over a bridge, and then they just kind of fucking puss out, like they couldn't do it. Like there's this weird low shot, so you can't see the bottom of the frickin' fire trucks. But, but overall, that's a pretty cool scene. It's it's one of the better ones in the movie. Bond and Stacy sneak into Main Strike Mine, where explosives are being dropped off by the truckload. There's a pretty awesome set for the big blow-up finale. The big the big plot here is finally revealed. Zorin's gonna blow the explosives and flood Silicon Valley. The nifty big old map shows this. Dastardly indeed. A chase ensues with Mayday, and Zorin starts murdering his own men left and right. Roger Moore has said he didn't like this in the film, and it, because it was too dark, but I actually enjoyed that it, it took a familiar Bond trope the base full of henchmen, and it did something different. Kind of reinforces that Zorin is a psycho when he kills all his own men and laughs all the while. Crazy Nazi-bred supervillain. Bond and Mayday finally scuffle before falling into the floodwater. Mayday switches sides upon her betrayal and helps Bond raise the detonator with her super strength. Lots of silly timer issues, like, you know, it says two minutes, but it's clearly going to take more than two minutes. But whatevs, it's all good. Mayday rides the bomb out of the mine and saves the day and gets her revenge, and it's it's a good ending to a pretty enjoyable henchman. So Zorin, plan foiled, kidnaps Stacy for giggles, and Bond dangles on the mooring rope. Heh, <laughs> mooring. This leads to some cool shots San Francisco before Zorin tries to whack Bond into the Golden Gate Bridge, only to have Bond tie the mooring rope and stop the blimp. Big final fight starts with the blimp thrashing around as Stacy dangles, and Bond and Zorin fight on the support beams of the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's a pretty epic idea, and it's it's relatively well done. I, I liked it. Zorin dies, the blimp blows, Gogol stops by to give Bond the order of linen. Bond is still in San Francisco, getting his ending of the film sex on, while Q watches with his robot. And the Roger Moore era of James Bond films ends appropriately silly. So yeah, like heck of a send-off for more, right? Am I right? Am I, no, no, no. At best, A View to a Kill slightly upstages the man with the golden gun in terms of action and plot, and though some of the minimal action here is a bit forced and the story is one of the most dated in the series, A View to the Kill nonetheless has some good things going for it. First, though tacky and dated, it does have a decently well thought out plot. Yeah, anything with computers in 1985 is going to look silly now, but the whole idea of blowing and flooding a fault line is pretty cool. I'll take this plot over a lot of the later Bond films. And yeah, Moore is old, but Christopher Walken ain't, and neither is Grace Jones. They both kick serious ass in this film. Walken, like Christopher Lee before him, plays Zorin much calmer than one would think, with a hint of insanity just beneath the surface. I like his creepy laugh, especially when he dies, and how casual he truly seems when killing people. It's a bit dark for a Roger Moore Bond film, but it's different and engaging. That and Nazi-bred megalomaniacal supervillain is just a rad description. Yeah, it's arguably three films too late for Moore. Hell, he started playing Bond when he was 45, he's 57 here, but he's still in okay form, even if he sounds older and dirt, and his grandchildren are as old as Tanya Roberts. I'll take old Moore over no more.
More More is best. And though it's not a great film, A View to a Kill is at the very least a Bond film, something the series would get a bit shaky on in the years to come. Though director John Glenn would helm the next two, this is the one to me that feels like the end of an era, the last Bond film to really feel like one. It wins points with me for that, and my biased love for Roger Moore. So yeah, it ain't one of the best, but the series will show just how wrong it can get things in the years to come.